My name is Gary Kaufman. I'm a career-long respiratory therapist, and it's my pleasure today to bring to you a presentation on servant leadership, the key to effective communication and management. My disclosures are a financial relationships consultant speaker for Monaghan Medical Corporation, and I am the manager for Kaufman Consultant. I have fiduciary relationships. I won't read them there, but they are volunteer roles within the AERC. I'm most proud to be an AERC member. I'm most proud to be a respiratory therapist. There is no, none of these relationships bear any uh, connection with the content of this, but I wanna make full disclosure so that you are aware. So I'm gonna turn off my video so you can see my slides and let's talk about servant leadership. Proceeds from my honorarium will be provided to the following charities. I thank all of you for providing this opportunity for our family to support organizations that provide care to those most in need. And as we say, food and clothes for the body, hope for the soul. Here are the learning objectives. Understand the foundation of leadership. What is this leadership thing? Isn't it just management in different clothes? Appreciate the characteristics of servant leadership. So we need to understand what leadership is first before we can uh, understand servant leadership. And third is apply the principles of servant leadership to improve your leadership skills and your competencies. Whether you're a night shift therapist, whether you're a weekend option therapist, whether you're an educator, a manager, director, an RT navigator, we are all leaders. We can, and I'll suggest we all need to be servant leaders. I'm going to show you probably dozen and a half quotes, dozen and a half definitions, and some really interesting quotes from people that you'll recognize. And the reason I have all these slides is I've not found one definition of leadership or servant leadership or management that is all encompassing. I will say I like this one for the reasons of the words I under. So what is leadership? It's the skill of influencing people to enthusiastically work toward goals identified as being for the common good with character that inspires confidence. So let's underline skill, influencing, carrier, character, and common good. You will see the word influence, influencing. You'll hear me say influence or influence many times during this presentation. Leadership is not management. Leadership is this and some other words that I'll, that I'll provide during the presentation. So what's a skill? Can leadership be learned? Can leadership skills be improved or are we just born with what we got and we got to run the table with that? Are some people born leaders and the rest of us, hey, it's not our ability to do that? The answer lies in the definition of the next slide, but I'm here to state that a skill is learned or acquired. Just like I learned to play baseball, very average baseball player, by the way, by practice, 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 we had coaches for throwing, for fielding, for hitting. Uh, we didn't have psychological uh, counselors in those days like the current athletes have. Uh, but it's repetition. So we use books and webinars such as this and articles, uh, groups. Uh, the AERC has groups for us to improve our leadership skills. Again, regards, it's not what's on your badge. It's what's in your heart that you want to develop. Peter Drucker, probably the name most associated with leadership, and I might say management, has this quote. There may be some born leaders, but there are too few of them for us to count on them. Leadership can and must be learned. That's Peter Drucker. And if you're looking for a book on management, I Google Peter Drucker and just start reading whatever he has that you find on the web. 
John Maxwell and Ken Blanchard are two of the more recent uh, authors that you'll see. And I think this is important to make a point. I said it before, leadership is management. They're two different things. Yes, there's some overlap in that. Uh, but leadership is not management. John Maxwell said, and look at the word, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. I kind of like that. I kind of like that quote. I can remember it. But I'll say that I think there is more to leadership. But if you cannot influence, you can't be a leader. What is leadership? And Blanchard said, it's an influence process. So is it a skill? Is it a learned skill? Can it be developed? Absolutely, yes. What these three leadership gurus say, it all boils down to leadership. So first, we need, I need to restate, leadership is not management. Each of these individuals say it's influence. And we'll talk about how we influence others. Max Dupree, in fact, I think he was one of the authors of AERC uh, Leadership Book Club or a reference a few years ago. And I'll come back to that because it's a great, great opportunity for all of us to improve our leadership skills for free, thanks to AERC. Leadership is an awesome responsibility. And Mr. Dupree says, leadership is serious meddling in other people's lives. Meddling. I read this quote and I thought, what the heck is he talking about? So what's a practical example of that? You're a staff therapist and you get behind in first round of therapies. You're just not going to be able to complete all the nebulizer treatments on time. You have a choice. You can say, look, they're always looking. I need to get four nebs done in 30 minutes. I'll put an aerosol mask on each one. Go room to room to room to room. That's serious meddling in other people's lives. And I want to use, I want to use this example because we can all identify with it. Whether we call that stacking or concurrent therapy or unattended therapy, whatever term you use, when you put that aerosol mask on that nebulizer, forget the brand of nebulizer, but you put an aerosol mask on that nebulizer, what percent of the medication gets to the patient's mouth? You tell me. If an individual is breathing a one to three IE ratio, you're probably saying, Gary, why are you talking IE ratios on a presentation about servant leadership? Here's why. Serious meddling in other people's lives and health and safety and clinical outcomes. So go back to my question. You put that aerosol mask, you know, the one the big holes in, on a nebulizer, you go room to room to room. What percent of medication gets the patient's mouth? Not lungs. That depends on the quality of the nebulizer, but just to the mouth. The eye ratio is one to three. I'm going to suggest only 25% of what you put in the cup gets to the lips. That's serious meddling in other people's lives. And here's, here's a question. If you are forced to stack in order to meet some productivity target, which, by the way, is shameful. But if you're forced to do it, I was, and I, I'm here to tell you, I'm embarrassed that as a manager, way long ago in my career, I accepted that as a standard of care. And I, I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. But we change things. If you know that's happening, and you know that that's not clinically effective, what is it that you do? You're a leader. The department manager said, look, get the treatments done. However it gets done, just get them done. Make sure they're documented. We need to drop those charges. If you're a night shift therapist or a weekend option therapist, you, you need to knock on that door and say, this is not appropriate care. You may not be able to change it today. You may not have enough staff to do one-to-one -one therapy, but that conversation needs to have because Mr. Dupree says that's leadership. It's an awesome responsibility. And here's the example I give when I get pushback. If a physician or an APP orders 50 milligrams of medication for the nurse to hang in a uh, liter bag, how many milligrams did the nurse put in there? 50 milligrams, right? That's what the doc ordered. Why would they do anything different? Physician orders a certain number of milligrams for a bronchodilator to be put, delivered to the patient, and we knowingly 
put an aerosol mask on that patient that only delivers 25%, to me, that's unethical. It's clinically ineffective. It's unethical. And leadership is an awesome responsibility. If you can't get your treatments done, and we've all been there, you just get slammed in behind, you just say, ah, I'll let it slide. I didn't get there. Do you stack? Or do you call the team lead and say, I need your help? If we're going to do it right, we need to assume an awesome responsibility because that's who we are. You can get your finger slapped. Trust me, I have. But you need to stop at that moment a leader, night shift therapist, a navigator, an educator, department head. You need to stop and have the conversation. We need to do it right. Quite frankly, and I say this very publicly beyond just this recorded webinar, if we're stacking nebulizers as a way to get the treatments done, we're not needed. You don't need a therapist to do that. That's just not right. So please join me in accepting an awesome responsibility. Dwight Moody, I read this quote, I don't know, decades ago. What's character? The person you are in the dark when nobody's looking. So you go back to that last issue. Can't get my nibs done. Do I just write patient not available? Uh, do I skip it? Don't I tell anybody? And I just, you know, get a cup of coffee and get ready for second rounds. No, not if you have character, true character. It's not, you're the same person when nobody's looking as when everyone has their eyes on you. Not just a catchy phrase from Mr. Moody, who's a brilliant person by the way, but that defines character. You cannot be a servant leader, in my opinion. And I don't profess to be a great servant leader. I'm probably mediocre on, on many days, but if you do something differently just because you can get away with it, that's not a servant leader. That's not a leader. That's not an ethical respiratory therapist. So Warren Bennett says, leadership is character in action. General Norman Schwarzkopf, you certainly, I'm sure most everybody, if not everybody's aware of his uh, prominence, 99% of leadership failures are failures of character. So let's just take a minute and talk about this. If I were gonna paraphrase these two quotes, intention without action is nothing. I uh, paraphrase a quote that intention without action is hallucination. I can't remember the, the source of the quote. That sounds to be a bit, bit of a bold statement, but intention without action results in nothing. I want to do this. I intended this. I really wanted to talk to my boss about stacking. I really wanted to talk about my boss about the, a new schedule model. I really wanted, but I did nothing. Nothing results. So leadership, servant leaders are those who come up with an idea or support others with an idea and drive it to implementation to the best of your ability. Now, if you're a, a clinical therapist, frontline therapist, and your team gets together to propose a new staffing model that will eliminate stacking and needs more staff, please don't hold it against your department director who can't get the resources. Particularly, again, I'm recording this, we're in a bad spot with vacancies and need for more therapists. As you know, the world needs more RTs and your, your department probably does as well. So don't hold it against the department head, the director, manager, whatever her title is, that they can't get the resources, but don't give up either. Intention without action results in nothing. Where do you take that staffing model? you and your boss, your team lead, your department director, need to meet with your RT medical director. That's certain leadership. You're serving the patient to give them effective care. To not do that is to not be a servant leader. And you quote me on that. You may not get what we need. You may not get what you want, but you need to go to the best of your ability. And I am not talking about strikes and ball calls and that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about to the best of your ability to show why the individuals that we serve need our services 
and how many therapists you need to provide high quality services. That's our job as leaders, as servant leaders, I'll suggest that takes it up a notch because we're doing this not because we want more therapists on day shift and night shift, because of patients demand it because that's what they need. I copied this slide from a friend of mine who had this lecture and I thought, this is too easy, but it's not. Character is defined and demonstrated when we make the best choices in any given situation. I talked to a group of therapists a number of years ago and about their uh, on-call policy. So we don't have an on-call policy. I said, really? Pretty big department. Um, we just stay over. If three people call in sick on nights, somebody from days stays over. How much over? Well, the whole shift. That's 24 hours in a row. I don't think that's the right choice. Maybe an extra six on that end and have somebody from days next day come in and work the back half of nights. But that stimulus, how you respond to that stimulus is what determines character. If you say, okay, just, you know, we're not going to do any, any of the inhalers or the low priority treatments because three people called in, that's it. That's not a servant leader. It's making, doing the best that you can do. It might mean calling in, not the dog barking in the background, but it might be, she might be signaling, hey, it's time to get out of bed, Mr. Director, and you need to help out night shift. When the beeper goes off, probably not a dog bark, when the beeper goes off in the middle of the night, and hey, we need you, boss. We need you, manager. We need you, navigator, to come in. That defines servant leadership. United States Marine Corps. I did not serve in the military. I, res I respect, uh, I am uh, in awe of people that I have. Leadership, the quality is a moral character that enable a person to inspire and influence a group of people successfully. Qualities, moral character, inspire, influence, and that's how you're successful. I think it's a quote we should all use. Character, inspire, influence, and that's how you lead a group and be successful. Notice influence, it's in almost every single one of these definitions. Now you're probably saying, why are we talking about power? We need to talk about power and authority and even love. Not love as we think about it, but love in a little bit different definition. So let's start with power. Power is the ability to force, coerce others to do your will, even if they would choose not to, because it's on your name badge. Do it or else. Another way to state this, hey, I'm the boss, do it because I said so. I know you're short, just get it done. Cut whatever corners you need to get it done. I'm the boss, go get those treatments done. That's power. Question I have, does this motivate you? Hmm. What's the boss doing? Sitting in his office while you're struggling, you're three down on day shift. That individual, he has power to do it. But do you want to work for that person? Do you, are you motivated? I think the answer is no and no. We're going to talk about later what you need to do about that, just like the uh, issue I talked about with nebulizers or being short-staffed. Yes, we can all be forced to do something because we have to whether it's stop signs or staffing model or break policy, we have to do it. Here's an example. A number of years ago, an employee engagement consulting firm was hired by the hospital I worked at, and they published a survey. And this is, this is over 30 years ago. I'll never forget it. And in our education as department heads, we were asked to educate our staff, make sure that they did the confidential anonymous survey, and uh, because we were under feedback. I'm less interested in the numbers, quite frankly, as is what could we do differently to improve? Whether we're 4.2 or 4.3, quite honestly, I know what those numbers mean. I wanna know what the staff said. This is what we need to fix. This is what we can do better. But here's the statement that I think is the most powerful. I've never forgotten it. 80%, I'm paraphrasing from 30 years ago, 80% of how an employee feels about their organization 
is a result of how they feel about their direct supervisor. Let's take a minute and think about this. If my supervisor is a servant leader, whether it be the team lead, the manager, the director, or whomever, if my direct supervisor is a servant leader and I feel good about their servant leadership skills, I'm going to put a high score, a high rating in that employee engagement survey. 80% of how I feel about my organization is the direct influence of my direct supervisor. My hospital could be a terrible place to work for. I hope this isn't true for any of you, any of, any of you listening to this. It could not, it, they might have the lowest pay. They may have the you know, worst staffing model, other things, uh, lousy food, <laughs> lousy food uh, don't use protocols, you name it. It could be a terrible place to work. But if my supervisor is a servant leader, and I'm paraphrasing, my supervisor is a servant leader, and I feel good about her, I'm going to stick with that hospital. I think that's an amazing statistic. And I remember the, the uh, HR consultant saying, this has been tested with over 100,000 responses over the past 10 or 12 years that they had been doing the survey. So think about that. Our relationship with our immediate supervisor and if you supervise someone else, that's the most powerful determinant of what the employee at whatever level in the organization, could be the VP, could be department head, could be night shift therapist. That's the, the most powerful driver of how the, how the in-person feels about their organization. You know why that's important? That determines whether you stay or go. Hey, I know we don't get paid the best here, but we use protocols, the docs consult with us, the nurses, and we have a great relationship with the nursing. And even the vice president of finance walks through the, the ICU and gives us high fives. I want to work there. And I don't care if I get a buck more down the road for him. I want to work at this hospital. So that's the power of servant leaderships. Margaret Thatcher, never met the lady, Mr. Soul said that being in power is like being a lady. If you have to remind people that you are, you aren't. <laughs> I mean, I laughed when I first read this, but I think it's an important. If you demand respect, adherence, and use power because of your badge, you're not. You're just not a leader. Simple as that. This wasn't written for respiratory therapists in the hospitals, I'm pretty sure. But I think if, if you say, we need to do this, I got the badge, I got the power, I have the authority, I can change your schedule if you don't do it, if you don't like it, you're not a leader. Certainly not a servant leader. So let's talk, let's move from power to authority. Authority is the skill of getting people to willingly do your will because of your personal influence. Power Get the treatments done, stack them, whatever it takes. I'm the boss. I, I said so. That's power. Authority is, hey, I want to work for you. I'll do it for you. Because that supervisor, that director, that team leader, whomever, has the skill to say, not the badge. We need to do it because of the patient. So how is power and authority different? Power can be bought and sold, given, taken away. It's the badge, it's the money, it's the position, it's the organization, it's the hierarchy. It can all change tomorrow. Your hospital could close tomorrow. Your hospital could be purchased tomorrow. And you get a new boss who's a servant leader. Power is ephemeral. Goes away in a minute, a day, a month. Authority, no. It's never bought or sold, given or taken away. It's who you are. So if you have a servant leader, who leaves your organization and goes to another organization, might you want to follow them? Yep, because that's who they are. That's their character. And studies have shown in the human resource literature that when uh, an individual, but particularly a, a traditional leader, department head, executive, moves across town, people come with her, with her because I want to work for her. She's a servant leader. Authority is simply, I'll do it for you. You inspire me, you motivate me. You're the real deal. You do what you say. Your intentions are actions. 
and you're willing to inspire the team and give the team credit rather than taking personal credit. And I am guilty of this. So when I'm pointing the finger at my screen and my one dog is barking to say, Dad, you're certainly guilty of many things. I have been guilty of being in the limelight. So if we had a team and we accomplished uh, a uh, reduction in length of stay or readmissions, I was in the picture. In some cases, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I was in the front row. I should be in the back row, if at all. When I look at a post on social media, whatever it might be, and the individual saying, I and me and myself, and it's really the team, you're not a servant leader. Not a servant leader. That's power. That's the badge. I led a team. Yeah, you led a team, but it was the team that achieved that. You're the team lead. You're the department head. You're the vice president. You're the division uh, chairperson. Yeah, you led the team, but get in the back row. Let the team be in the front for the picture. So I challenge you. In fact, I started doing this in one of the social media, uh, just people that are friends on, on the social media platform. And I started making a note of how many times, including myself, that the picture of the person was front and center and used the word I. Here to tell you, I did it. I've really tried not to do that. And actually go, and, go into social media and, and tell me if, if I'm guilty of this. It is amazing how frequently that post on social media is how that person plays it in their organization. And this is not about a street therapist. I think we're all either can be absolved of it or guilty of it. But when you start, I, 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 that's not a servant leader, the team. I think it's okay to say my team. I'm going to credit to my team. We achieved the Apex Award. But when the picture is taken, servant leaders are in the back row, even though they might have done most of the work. Vince Lombardi, I mentioned before, I'm going to use the word love, not the traditional love that we think of, but Vince Lombardi, pretty successful football coach, if you don't know, good one. I don't have to like my players and associates. Okay. But as a leader, I must love them. Love is loyalty. Love is teamwork. Love respects the dignity of the individual. And that is the strength of an organization. Loyalty teamwork, respect, dignity. As a servant leader, as we employ these competencies, we strengthen ourselves as servant leaders, we strengthen our time, we strengthen our organization, and quite frankly, we even strengthen the bottom line. Character, integrity, teamwork, respect, dignity, collaboration, improve safety, improve quality, and improve the bottom line. Doing things the right way at the right time with the right folks, with the right devices, with the right team, improve safety, quality, clinical outcomes, and finance. I've never seen it different. I don't expect ever to see it different. Is that the definition of servant leadership? Not necessarily. I think it is. So let's look at love in this context, the act of extending yourself for others by identifying and meeting their legitimate needs and seeking their greatest good. It's about them, not you. So extending yourself, what does that mean? I may have a leadership style that I've developed, but as I come to a new organization and the culture is different, I need to extend myself, expand my skill set, expand how I do things, maybe even how I talk, how I engage others, because it's about them, not me. And we need to meet their legitimate needs. And it says needs, not wants. We may want 20 therapists on days, but the needs might be 12 therapists on days. Legitimate needs for the greatest good. The greatest good for our most important person is our patients, our families, our communities but also our staff. A uh, book was written, uh, this was uh, AERC Leadership Book Club about two years ago, I think. And the title of the book was Patients Come Second. Scott Reistad, who, who leads our 
uh, Leadership Book Club sent this out and I immediately Googled it because obviously it's sort of caught your attention. Patients come second. No, they don't. They come first. And what this book, what the authors posit is you, we need to take care of ourselves such that the patients get the best care that they need. Yes, patients come first. That's the, the object of our care. But if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of them. This is a pre-pandemic book, by the way. I think it's even more powerful in the post-pandemic world. Hopefully, we're in a post-pandemic world. And it's the fourth leg of the quadruple aim. The triple aim did not include basically taking care of ourselves. That was added. A couple authors said, we need to take care of ourselves in order to be able to meet the needs of those we care for. And I believe it to be true. I think you, I don't think anyone would argue. So love is as love does. Sounds like a you know, catchy quote, but that's the same thing I mentioned before. Intentions need to become actions. If you want to do it, but don't do it, nothing happens. So it's thinking about <clears throat> your commitment to others. Now I'm going to go in the next few slides. We're going to walk through the components of this particular model that I that I read a few years ago, and I heard presented at a conference. So the components of this are leadership, authority, sound familiar, service, and sacrifice. So think back to the last slide. Sacrificing maybe how I'd like to do it to the needs of our patients, our communities, and others. Love, as we talked about, the Vince Lombardi definition of love, and will. So let's just take a look at these. What's here? Leadership, authority, service, sacrifice, love, and will. Ooh, what's missing? Knowledge? Well, don't we have to have the knowledge? Yes. We obviously need to have the knowledge to do a budget, to do a care plan, to plan your uh, patient care activities for your ship. We need that law. We need that. But knowledge is not really called out in the servant leadership model. And the reason I like that is it, it, if, you, if we had knowledge here, it would assume that the more knowledge that you have, the better servant leader you could be. And that is nothing could be farther from the truth. So knowledge is not in the model. So just to restate, intentions without actions, nothing happens. Intentions plus action creates will. And will is the culmination of this. And it's not just wishing. It's that's the will that really frames what you're going to do during your shift, your month, your all your responsibilities. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this slide. How do we get to character? Ah, oh, he's a character. Oh, he's, does that mean he tells good jokes? Oh, man, he's a bad character. Or boy, you don't have to question her character. She's the real deal. She does what she says she's going to do. She helps others. She gives credit to the team. So character can mean a whole bunch of things. So let's walk through each of these skills and how that culminates in defining leadership, servant leadership, by looking at love and character. So first skill is patience. Why? We need self-control. Man, I really, we really need that extra high flow. We need that ventilator. We need it today. Well, the budget doesn't start till July, and we may not be able to be approved till October. Well, we may not get it. So we need to show self-control as professionals, as clinician professionals, but also as leadership. Uh, kindness, to give attention, appreciation, encouragement, common courtesy. You heard the phrase, it's just common courtesy to do the following, opening the door for someone, asking the patient how they feel before you say, I'm here to give you treatment. That's common courtesy. That's kindness. That, by the way, shows up in patient satisfaction or patient engagement service, uh, surveys and, ra and ratings, I should say. Did they uh, treat me as an individual? Did they give me individualized attention? Did they explain what they were doing? Did they tell me what's going to come next? Did they, those are questions in the patient engagement survey, right out of the survey, not paraphrased them, 
but how can we as therapists, as servant leaders, regardless of our what's on our badge? Here's the answer. Humility, to be authentic, not boastful, arrogant, prideful, puffed up. None of us want to work with a jerk, to be honest. Not boastful, arrogant. Yeah, I, 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 I did this. Well, the team did. What happens? We drift away from that person who's not a leader, even though that might be on their badge. We go to those individuals who are true servant leadership. And that might not even be somebody in our department. Respect, treat others as important. And I don't remember the conference I was at years ago, but someone had a slide that said, uh, basically a blank slide, and they put up the golden rule. What's the golden rule? Treat others as you would like to be treated. And the speaker said, isn't that what we should be doing? By showing hands. All the hands went up in the air, including mine. She said, no, that's not enough. I thought, huh? But the golden rule is a golden rule. What could be better than the golden rule? And then she put up on this next slide, the platinum rule. My first thought is, come on, it's just consultant speak or fancy speaker speak. It's not at all. The platinum rule is treat others as they wish to be treated. That's a big difference in perspective and in my opinion, how servant leaders act. The platinum rule. I try to practice it. Don't always get there, but I try to practice it. Not what I want, but who would they want? Selflessness. Meet the needs of others, not I come first, not I'm in front of the, of the photo for our Apex Award. Forgiveness. Give it up. Tough. Tough for me. If I felt that I was wrong when I had a budget proposal and finance said, no, we're not, we're not going to buy your ventilators. We need to buy a new CT scanner. Uh, for which we could buy 10 ventilators, by the way. Uh, did I say that out loud? Yes, I did. But you got to give it up. If you resent that, it will show in your interactions. What will we do in this case? I'll use a real live example. Is I and my medical director got together and said, uh, while we understand we just don't have the money to buy everything that we all would like, here's what we'll need as a result. And would you please revisit this maybe second quarter. Currently, we don't have enough ventilators, so we're renting ventilators, and here is the cost of that. This will be the cost at the end of the year if we can't purchase additional new machines. That may not mean that you get it, but it might, it leaves finance uh, or budget committee, you did your homework. Well, and the answer might be, just keep on renting. We honestly don't have enough to buy the devices. Or it could be, second quarter, that budget committee uh, chair or finance director or VP of finance said, look, I remember hearing from those, those lung people that they were spending a lot of money on rentals. Let's revisit that. You know, we have some extra money. Maybe we can buy a couple of ventilators now and we'll save the rental expenses and the PM expenses. That's where forgetting gets you to the next level. Honesty, I don't have to talk about commitment. Stick to your choices. If you're committed, let's use the ventilator request. You're committed to requesting additional ventilators for your patients, not because they're bright and shiny and I want the newest machines, but if, if, those, if a newer ventilator or nebulizer or high flow, whatever your device that you're looking at, if it does better for the patient, we have a moral and ethical obligation as a servant leader to stick to it. Don't fuss and fret about it, but say, this is what we need and why we need it. There are no human beings, only human becomings. Sounds like another catchy phrase you read in some soppy philosophical journal or whatever, but I think it's important. You might be thinking, Gary, you're just using some catchy quote and it doesn't really connect to servant leadership. I don't think that's the case because this statement to me defines what we are and how we need to practice as servant leaders. We're never going to get all the knowledge we need. We're never going to get the skills, the competencies, no matter how much we read and listen, even to webinars like this. We will become the best that we can be as servant leaders by appreciating we're still a work in progress. As good as we are today, and I might be mediocre, I can be one step above mediocre tomorrow by practicing 
the information in webinars such as this and attending conferences or virtual conferences, which are becoming more the norm than, than in person. Ancient Chinese prophet. If you don't change your direction, you'll end up exactly where you are headed. I've, I've heard this restated a number of times. It's a quote that's on my desk. This doesn't state that applies to servant leaders, but I think it does. I'll suggest that this aligns nicely with our understanding of where we're at and defining the plan to achieve the best we can be as servant leaders. Do you have a written plan of your goals? I want to achieve this, then this, then this. Honestly, I say this every year as part of my New Year's resolutions. I'm going to get a written plan for improving my health. I'm thinking it. I got it in my head. But what is that to be? Eat better. Exercise regularly. Attend uh, support groups to support others. Help others in need. Provide uh, donations to charitable organizations. And someone said to me years ago, if you don't write it down, you're not going to do it. You may, get, you may get lucky and do some, but they have a written plan. So I love this quote, quote by Leo Tolstoy, who I wouldn't think it would come from him. Everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change themselves. And another quote that comes from Alcoholics Anonymous, no, I'm not, I uh, haven't needed their services, but the only person you can change is yourself. Another quote, uh, I'll paraphrase again, is I love change, you first. That's not servant leaders. Servant leaders understand that the way to achieving transformative positive change is to start with yourself. And here's another quote. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm better than I used to be. That's continuous improvement. Are we ever going to achieve perfection in our clinical services or putting a budget together or a staffing plan? Absolutely not. But I'm better than I was yesterday. Our staffing model was good. We got a team together and the team said we could we can massage, we could put a mid-shift together and maybe pull these hours around here. We could kind of better address the needs of our patients, kind of, uh, I say, carve off some of those peaks of the 7, 11, 3, and 7 by using a mid-shifter. We implemented as a pilot. The team said, let's try this. I think this could work. And it did, not because of me. I was the secretary. They did all the work, they designed it, and they measured the improvement in performance that resulted from that as far as missed and delayed therapies. So here's a practical application. Will you make a change in your life as a result of listening to this presentation? Absolutely not because I'm the one doing it. I am the connector of some really bright people, some servant leaders, and a whole bunch of opportunities to look at influence and value and commitment and support. My goal for this webcast is to provide you with information that you can use to motivate yourself. I can't motivate you. Nobody can motivate us. That's, that's going to be, uh, has to be internal. In my opinion, my reading and talking to experts in this, no one can motivate me. And I, I would like to think they can engage me, they can excite me, but motivation is I'm taking something, I'll just speak personally for a moment, I'm taking some new information or new skills or learning, and I have to apply that to motivate myself. I honestly don't believe that the boss can motivate me by saying, go forward, get motivated. I just don't think it's that way. That's my opinion. And goodness knows I could be wrong, but I think that's, for me, that's how I get one step better each day, each week, each month, each year. So my question to you is, what have you learned during this webcast that you can make a change? If you've learned one thing and make a change, I think we're successful together. 10% of you experience a lasting change in your lives as a result of being here today, listening to this on-demand webinar. We can make a difference. It will be 
measurable. So how do we do that? A plan. Personal development plan. And this I, I abstracted from a, a conference that I attended. And I think it, it helps me concretize, put all this stuff together. How do I get from intentions to destiny? I'll explain what that means. Intentions must become actions. If not, nothing. Actions have to become habits. If I want to improve my health by eating better and exercising regularly, but they don't become habits, I'm not going to achieve that. Habits actually define character. Not, be, not define it in total, but habits are a big driver of character. I mentioned in another webinar, if I got behind first round of uh, therapy and I'm just not going to get four my nebulizer treatments done, do I look the other way? Do I stack them? Do I ask for help? Hey, team lead, please help me. Patients need us. That habit defines character. Your habit of looking the other way defines a character that I don't want to work with. Character is what drives destiny. And that sounds like a big word. But destiny is what we can become, what we aspire to become. So intentions, the actions, the habits, the character, that's how we get to our destiny. I'm never going to run a four-minute mile. Probably never run a five-minute mile again. I think about it. But my destiny is to be the best I can in that. Not to be the best of all, but to be the best that I can. Now, before I conclude this, What's not miss? What's missing here? Position. What's on your name badge? So your personal development plan is not about getting a raise or a new position. It's not about position. It's not what's on your badge. So when I, when I look at this, position just isn't on there because that's not important. So how do we do this? Set a goal, identify the gaps, eliminate the gaps, and measure result. Practical example. I want to become a team leader in my organization. Where are the gaps? What skills, knowledge, competencies will I need to be successful? Maybe a team lead needs to, needs to have a certain credential that I don't have. I get it. Either on my own, or maybe a hospital provides that to me. So I need a neonatal credential or adult critical care credential or maybe a, a degree. That's the gap. I need to get the plan. So the plan is, what are my current skills, knowledge, competencies, and what am I going to need to get there? I may need a mentor. I may need half a dozen of you folks to help me get through uh, ACLS program. Identify it, and then once you get there, that's not the end, is measure results. We may fall short of that goal. It may not work because the circumstances weren't working. We may have you know, trauma in our personal life that did not allow us this year to get our baccalaureate degree, finish our baccalaureate degree. That's okay. Write down the reason we didn't do it. We had some really traumatic issues in our family, not applying personally now, and I just had a withdrawal. But I'm going to get back on that fall semester and finish that last course for my baccalaureate degree. So when you hear people say, ah, it doesn't work, try that. Ask the question, why didn't it work? Why and are those same issues today? Maybe it didn't work back in the day because we didn't have the resources we had today. So don't allow anyone, ah, try that didn't work. Why didn't it work and why? Here's some resources. As you know, I'm a former president of the AERC. I'm a career-long uh, AERC member, and I can't think of a better place to go for resources on leadership. Join the AERC if you're not a member. Please join. It's 25 cents a day. It's the best investment in your career. Join the AERC Leadership Management Section, Leadership Book Club, Leadership Grand Rounds, and AERC Connect Community. Just a wealth of resources. For me, it really comes down to this. Am I going to choose to be a servant leader or a self-serving leader? 
The choice is ours, yours, mine, our team, our organization, our family, whatever the individuals and teams and groups are. It's up to us. Self-serving leader stands in front of the line when the picture's taken, uses the word I rather than team, us, our team, our organization. That's the difference between a self-serving leader and a servant leader. With that, I want to thank you for being an RT, and I want to thank you for being an RT leader.